Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I have the great pleasure to be discussing proteins with you. This podcast is about protein structure, in other words, how amino acids or peptides come together to produce these big polymers that we call proteins. And, you know, um, one of the things that I want to say right out of the gate about proteins is the name itself sort of implies its significance. Pro means a first, like a prologue in a, in a book. They're of first importance. These, these macromolecules, these proteins, basically make up all living things. And ultimately, if you're like, well, I, th I thought nucleic acids, I thought DNA were, was the most significant uh, biological organic molecule. Indeed, those molecules uh, work to produce proteins. So proteins get things done. Proteins make up our whole body, and there's so many different functions uh, it's almost impossible to discuss them in a single podcast. So I'm just going to say that they're instrumental in almost everything an organism does. And we have tens of thousands of different proteins, and each of them are unique with their own function. And what's the most important thing that I want to say about uh, proteins right out of the gate is that their three-dimensional structure, and this is a picture of a computer-enhanced uh, three-dimensional X-ray crystallography, uh, of a protein, but the three-dimensional structure, and again, this is 3D, so picture this as a blob. All of these little crevices and alcoves and these little notches, all are significant. Because if you can make different shapes, different, different structures, you can have different functions. And so that's really, really significant. So it's the function of a protein that really gives it its uh, intrinsic, uh, its shape gives it its intrinsic, intrinsic function. Hard to, get, hard to get that out. And so one of the things that I want to say about a protein right out of the gate is that, again, its structure is very complex. And, and its complexity comes from the fact that it's three-dimensional, not too unlike other molecules that are three-dimensional, but they're constructed from these 20 monomers. Now, a protein's a polymer, and the 20 monomers are amino acids. And Amino acids can also be called peptides. And so if you put peptides, and there's many of them, you, you call this a polypeptide. So proteins can be composed of polypeptides. That's one way of saying it. And what's interesting is that a protein, as we're going to learn in this video, can be composed of more than one polypeptide chain. And so I like this beaded model here because each color represents one of the 20 different amino acids, if you will. So can you imagine? in terms of the diversity, like, you know, in the English language, we have 26 letters of the alphabet, and you can arrange those in different sequence, and that composes all of the, the words that make up our dictionary. And so can you imagine? Uh, proteins could be thousands of peptides long, and so the, the enormity, the complexity, the diversity is just mind-boggling. And so this is why there's diversity uh, in organisms. And so Let's get into the structure of an amino acid. An amino acid is has this central carbon right here. It's sometimes referred to as the alpha carbon. There's only one of them. And it has, and this is like your carbon background, backbone. So it has this amino group coming off of it, which is a characteristic of being slightly basic. And then it has a carboxylic acid group coming off over here. So that's the name amino acid or a peptide. What's coming off the alpha carbon is the letter R, and this represents right here the 20 different possible combinations and functional groups that give each amino acid its, its uh, specificity or, or its uh, uniqueness. And so the amino acid itself is, is pretty basic. Again, here's the amino group, here's the carboxylic acid group, and then here's the R group, and there's one of 20. Now, depending on what this is, what, what are some possibilities? Well, it could be very simple. It could be a single hydrogen. In that case, it would be um, glutamine or, or glycine. I, that's what I meant to say. It could be glycine, a single uh, hydrogen, or it could be something complex like uh, glutamine. And so what's interesting about this is that the physical characteristics of the R group is what is the variant. And so you, when you put all these amino acids together, it's really the R group that gives the amino acid its uniqueness. And so you have this amino group over here and this carboxylic acid, you're seeing it in an ionized state right here. So this is the carboxyl group, it's CH 
uh, COO minus, and this is CH3 plus. This is this in a Switzer ion formation, where it's both cation and anion. So let's take a little walk through the amino acids. And so, you know, being that this is a introduction to biology, it's it's never really going to be required to to memorize like the the structure of the amino acids. I mean, it's these these days it's quite easy to just call it up on on the on the computer and check it out. But it is incumbent upon us to sort of, you know, walk through and take a look at these. All of these amino acids, this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine amino acids are all char characterized by being nonpolar. Now, why is that? Because look at glycine right here. I was referring to this. This is the the most simple amino acid. It has a single hydrogen as its as its R group. And then there's alanine, it has this methyl group, and then valine. Do you notice how these are all nonpolar covalent bonds? And then there's leucine and isoleucine, methionine. Now, methionine has a, I wanted to point this out, it's somewhat special. There's two amino acids, as it turns out, that contain sulfur. It's methionine and cysteine. And so methionine is also kind of significant because most proteins begin with this amino acid. It's usually the first letter in a protein chain. So these are all, what do they all have in common? This, this highlighted area is, shows the fact that all of these are nonpolar amino acids. And ultimately, that's going to influence the three-dimensional shape when you put it all together, as we shall see. I also want to point out proline is kind of unique, because check this out. It's the one amino acid where its R group comes back and actually bonds to the amino side over here. So it forms like this little house structure that's of significance. It's often found in, in turns in a protein shape. And then you have these class of amino acids. These ones are considered to be polar. Do you notice here what gives them its polarity or their ability to form hydrogen bonds with other polar molecules? Is this hydroxyl group here, hydroxyl group, sulfhydryl group. Here's cysteine. It's the other amino acid that has the thiol group. And again, you may recall from a previous video that this is significant because this sulfhydryl group can form disulfite bridges with other amino acids holding uh, the three-dimensional shape of a protein together. So this one's a, important as well. Polar, polar, and polar. And so you have nonpolar, you have polar, and then there's actually some amino acids have a bona fide charge. Some are negatively charged, there's two negatively charged, and there's three positively charged amino acids. These can also be characterized as being basic uh, and acidic, again, capable of donating hydrogens in, in solution or, or, if you will, accepting hydrogens. And so they have these properties. And these are spartic acid, glutamic acid, lysine, arginine, and histine. So these are our 20 amino acids. What's pretty cool is that Organic chemists and biochemists are able to create new additional R groups, and so we've been able to synthesize amino acids beyond the 20, but these are the 20 naturally occurring ones. So how do they join? Well, let's, let's go through this. This is quite significant. So if you had this one amino acid over here, let me, let me highlight for emphasis the R group. Here's the R group right here that's coming off the central carbon. Now, you may, if I asked you if, what kind of characteristic is this, you would say it's polar. And then here's an R group over here. This is also polar. And this is also polar. It looks like we're choosing polar amino acids right in here. And so what, what we get here is there's one amino acid connected to another through a peptide bond right there. That's the bond between peptides. And how a new amino acid would join this chain or polymerize to to produce a growing polypeptide is a dehydration synthesis reaction. You may recall it, where one hydrogen from this amino group couples with that hydroxyl of the carboxylic acid and water is liberated. And as a result, the H2O is released in the form of water, you can see there, and then a new bond is formed between them. Okay, and so what we consider this, the NCC is the basic backbone, and then these are the side chains coming off of it. And so let's take a look at this. Let's see if you can do this. Like if you were to draw this and you'd say, okay, here's the nitrogen coming off. Here's the central carbon. Here's another carbon like this. And then here's a nitrogen, a carbon, a carbon. Here's a nitrogen, a carbon, and a carbon. Now, if I were to complete this, I'd say, okay, here's the central 
here's the central alpha uh, carbon right here. And then I would put, just for emphasis, let me uh, R group coming off the top like that. And then over here is the double bond oxygen. Here's the hydrogen here. So that's one amino acid. This would be the peptide bond right there, connecting this amino acid right there with this one. Come around like this. And then, so I'd have three. This would be a tripeptide. And so again, I would just complete that. There's a hydrogen there. I'm going to stay with the green. There's an R group coming off of this one. And then here's the double bond oxygen. There's the peptide bond. There's a hydrogen. There's the R group coming off. And then over here is the C terminus. In other words, the end. So this is a, a tripeptide right here. Now, I didn't show the water being liberated, but what I could what I could do is this. If I wanted to digest, if I wanted to break this up, in other words, uh, hydrolysis reaction, if I wanted to break down this into three peptides using hydrolysis, I would add water to this and water would come in and it would cleave or break the peptide bond. And how it does that is through this. Like, oh, let me erase the peptide bond. And so the H2O, let me just show that, the H2O. I'm going to put a OH there and then an H there. There you have it. And so this one is separate from this one now. There's the water. And then the same thing over here. If I add water over here, what's going to form is the OH over here and the hydrogen over here. And now I have three separate peptides. And so two waters are needed to break that peptide bond and that peptide bond. It's pretty cool. I would recommend, just as, a, as a, some advice, is to see if you can draw the backbone. And when I say backbone, I mean this, like this NCC, NCC, NCC. And then be familiar with the properties of these R groups. And then see if you can do a dehydration synthesis and a hydrolysis. It's fairly useful. Okay, So this repeating process of dehydration synthesis creates the polypeptide chain. And so here's, here's one amino acid and another one and another one. Do you notice the R group is shown here in blue and all the R groups are the same? Okay, And so these polypeptides can range in size. So you can have just a few peptides or you can have thousands when you link them all together. And so ultimately, the protein I alluded to this right in the very first statement is ultimately the function of a protein depends on its shape. And the, what we say when we're referring to proteins is it's, it's conformation. In other words, it's three-dimensional shape. Conformation is three-dimensional shape. It's very important. And so this is a, again, computer-drawn model three-dimensionally of what a protein looks like. Each of this sort of looks like ribbon would be these amino acids together like this. But do you notice that the protein three-dimensional shape is just not a string of pearls like this, like these amino acids, but rather there's twists and turns. And so if there's twists and turns, an interesting structure like a helix or like a sheet like this, you've got to assume there's some kind of bonding holding that together holding the twisted and the folded and the coiled into its unique shape. And so there's going to be chemical bonds holding the three-dimensional shape of a protein together in addition to the peptide bond that gives it its uniqueness. But ultimately, it's the order. This is very significant. It's the order of the amino acids that determines the three-dimensional conformation. Let me see if I can uh, get to that. Well. I will in a moment, but what I, what, what I want to say about this in terms of driving home the point about its unique conformation uh, determines its function, you may have heard of a very important protein that circulates in our blood. Our white blood cells, is, this is a cartoon drawing of white blood cells called lymphocytes. They're called B lymphocytes. If you've heard of these before, they, they secrete proteins called antibodies. And these antibodies sort of look like the letter Y like this. They look like this. And it, they're unique. Each one of them is unique. If I draw it three-dimensional, it sort of looks like a lobster claw. And what, what's important about this is that the unique claw of an antibody uh, is specific for a particular foreign germ, for example, that comes into the body. And so in order for an antibody to fight off disease, it needs to have a, an exact shape. 
And so there's many different kinds of antibodies, and they fight off only the foreign protein that it or foreign uh, substance that it binds with. And so that that's an example of the significance of of that. And there's I can go through many, but here's an example of three polypeptides all held together. And what's interesting is they form, you might be familiar with this somewhere in your background, these proteins can be embedded in the phospholipid bilayer of cell membranes. And their unique shape, and I mean protein, allows for the facilitation of, of specific solutes across the cell membrane. They're like little doors that are specific, and their specificity has to do with the shape of the protein. And I can continue. It's like a nerve cell receives certain messages from other nerve cells called neurotransmitters and again those are very specific and you have to have specific protein receptors and this is the way cells receive hormone messages it's the way in which cells ultimately communicate with one another and then ultimately the shape of proteins one of the most uh, primary uh, understandings of proteins are enzymes which are really cool proteins that catalyze chemical reactions and so the folding of a protein is really, really, really critical. And so it all starts from the chain of amino acid. And then it occurs kind of spontaneously. And what's interesting is we call these different levels of protein conformation. We say that the amino acid sequence, the amino acid sequence is the primary structure. Let me write that out. Primary structure is the amino acid sequence. In other words, like this what amino acids are in order. So if I ask you how to spell your name, you would say your name uh, consists of these letters in this specific order. Or how do you spell protein? It would be P-R-O-T-E-I-N. You need this amino acid, this amino acid, this amino acid, this one, this one, and this one in that particular order. This is the primary structure. And ultimately, the primary structure will lead to secondary, tertiary, and uh, quaternary uh, structure, the fourth level. And so before I get into this, let, let me take this away and show you um, a little bit of a, a video animation of this, this primary structure. So what we have going here is a chain of amino acids. What I like about it is that you can see that a protein is a polymer. You can see that this polypeptide is a chain of amino acids or a chain of peptides. And they're all linked together through these peptide bonds, and it's great. What is, what is not great about this is that the, the fact that they're all purple is suggestive of the fact their amino acids are all the same. So picture 20 different colors and random order. And so that random order ultimately will be determined by DNA. DNA contains the recipe for the amino acid sequence. And so here's your amino acids. Here's the backbone right here, NCC, NCC, NCC. So here's your basic amino acid. Here's the peptide bond right there and right there. And then these R groups come off and those R groups can be rather unique. They could be nonpolar, like these that are being shown. They could be polar like those. And so they give their uniqueness. They, some can be electrically charged, positive, or negative. And so the primary structure is the chain of amino acids, and it's pretty, pretty neat. And so that since there's so many amino acids, you can get quite a lot of uniqueness this way. So you're like, well, what about this secondary structure? Well, as it turns out, when you look at this primary structure, which is the sequence of amino acid, if you, if you move away from... Let me go back for a second. If you move away from the fact that these are considered to be little balls like this and you just draw it as a, as a ribbon, it's, it's somewhat useful. Because what can happen is these peptides can form a helix. And it's sometimes referred to as an alpha helix because there's two ways in which the secondary structure can form. There's an A and a B. The B is a pleated sheet. So a, a pleat, if you're familiar with this, like in pleated pants or pleated shorts or a pleated skirt, you get these sort of ribbon-like folds. And what's holding the helix together are hydrogen bonds. And so let me, let me emphasize that. Hydrogen bonds are holding secondary helixes together and sheets together. Let me play it out. So it's hydrogen bonds that are holding these secondary structures together.
And so um, what you get here is some fascinating ability, okay? So you, you get these helixes forming and some sheets forming, and this is referred to as secondary structure. Um, the peptide bonds are covalent bonds, and so what you see here is, here's an emphasis showing the hydrogen bonds that form between amino acids right here, those are the dotted lines right there, so that's what's holding the helix together, and this is what's holding the sheet together, is hydrogen bonds. Now, I know hydrogen bonds are not the strongest bond, but they're strength in number. And so let's, I think we're good with that. Okay, so what's the third level? The third level is tertiary. Now, the third level tertiary is where you get the three-dimensional structure. You get that the ultimate shape. So it's superimposed alpha helixes and beta pleated sheets. But what's holding that whole thing together is interaction between the R groups and the amino acids. And so let's just pause this for a second. And so do you notice here in the upper region, this amino acid is positive and this one is negative. Now it's fascinating because this could be like thousands of amino acids long, but if this one turns out to be negative and this one way over here is positive, there might be an ionic bond holding this part of the polypeptide with this one. Here is an example of a covalent bond between two sulfurs, a disulfide bridge. So this would be a covalent bond. Over here, you can have a hydrogen bond forming between two polar amino acids. And then you could even have some van der Waal forces, some nonpolar interactions occurring here, London dispersion, depending on the amino acids. And so ultimately, the primary structure, in other words, the position of the amino acids, dictates what kind of R groups will be able to interact with one another, but it's the R group that holds the three-dimensional tertiary structure together. And so it allows the protein to even bond with other molecules, like for example, water can hydrogen bond with, with proteins, and other functional groups can, can be attached to proteins as well. And so it's the R groups, and all, all four types of chemical bonds are involved in this. Now, you're like, well, what, what, what more can there be if there's, you have a three-dimensional structure? Well, the tertiary structure is the, the final confirmation, but this uh, quaternary, or the fourth level of structure, involves more than one polypeptide chain. If there's more than one polypeptide chain, like two or more, you can have two, you can have three, you can have four polypeptide chains. When there's more than one polypeptide chain, it's considered to be the fourth level. So this is the fourth level if you have two chains. And what's holding it together? The same kinds of interactions that was holding the tertiary together, which is R group bonding. A great example of this is hemoglobin, which is a real popular protein in our red blood cells. There's about 300 million hemoglobin proteins per red blood cell. And it turns out that there happens to be four polypeptide chains. Sometimes this is confusing to a beginning student because then you think that quaternary means that there has to be four polypeptide chains, but it doesn't have to be. You might know hemoglobin, that it has this heme grouper. It has iron here, and that helps it hold oxygen together. But there's another important structural protein called collagen that, that's very ubiquitous throughout the body. And collagen is made up of three polypeptide chains, and it's also considered to be tertiary. And, and each of the chains are like alpha helixes held together, so they're like really strong rope. And so it's like the thread that you'd find ultimately that holds tendons and ligaments and the matrix uh, between chondrocytes and cartilage together. So there, there's your, uh, your um, four levels of protein. And let me come back to, to conclude the slideshow here. And so those are those four levels. The, amino acid sequence, the alpha helix and beta pleated sheet, the th tertiary is the three-dimensional structure, and quaternary is more than one polypeptide chain. This polypeptide chain right here is the primary structure. Again, that is the sequence of amino acids. This happens to be a protein called lysozyme, which is an enzyme that we secrete in our tears that helps to uh, destroy bacterial cell walls. As it turns out,
Do you notice here that the amino acids are numbered? So lysine's number one here and arginine's number five, histine's 15. This is what I was saying in terms of like um, the sequence ultimately determines where there's going to be further bonding between them. Okay, and so ultimately it's the DNA, hugely significant. The DNA determines the polypeptide sequence and that's what gives everyone their uniqueness. And so what's significant is if you had a change in the nucleotide sequence of DNA, ultimately that'll result in the amino acid sequence being altered in the polypeptide. And a great example of this, we'll be talking about this in a later video, is that if you change the polypeptide, like for example in that protein hemoglobin we were talking about that's inside red blood cells, you'll ultimately affect the shape of the hemoglobin and then that'll manifest in its ability to not hold oxygen really well and it'll actually alter the shape of the red blood cell so that it kind of looks sickle sh shaped and it actually can clog tiny blood vessels called capillaries and cause intense pain. And so ultimately here's the uh, the normal or if you will, normal is not really a great word to use in biology, it's more, more like what's the most common in nature or the wild type. So this is the wild type amino acid sequence of hemoglobin and this would be a mutated one where it substitutes uh, valine right here and then the consequence is that the protein is different shaped inside which manifests in, a, in the whole cell looking sickle shape because a red blood cell is really a bag of hemoglobin and if the hemoglobin is oddly shaped the whole cell will be oddly shaped and so sometimes it's called sickle cell anemia because our spleen attempts to remove these red blood cells the white blood cells attack them because they look like they're they're malfunctioned or damaged or just needing to be recycled so primary structure leads to secondary structure and the secondary structure again is the alpha helix and the beta a and b there's two structures the helix and the sheet like this turn sheet pleated sheet like this and so there's two of these what holds it together hydrogen bonding but ultimately three-dimensionally speaking oh, before I get into that what's cool, cool about this is that you might know this that spider web spider web webs are uh, produced from silk which is a which is a protein and it's this beta pleated sheet the hydrogen bonds let me go back here Notice the hydrogen bonds between these uh, amino acids. It's very, very strong. It kind of reminds me of the surface tension that you have in, in water. Um, and so it's, it's quite formidable. It's like all of these amino acids are holding on pretty tight and that ultimately forms the strength of a spider web, which is ultimately pretty strong, like stronger than steel. It's pretty interesting. And so the tertiary structure, again, is here's the primary right here. And if this is cysteine right here, and then this is cysteine way over here, so da, 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 like that, you can form whoops, you can form a disulfide bridge doing that. I didn't mean to do that. Okay, back over here. So here's a R group. So it's a covalent bond. Here's an ionic bond. Here's a hydrogen bond, and here's a, a hydrophobic interaction or van der Waal forces. So those are the forces that hold the protein together three dimensionally. And these disulfide bridges are really strong, sulfur, sulfur. And it's like, you may think of like, well, how do you break a protein structure? How do you, how do you denature it, if you will? Well, you could add chemicals that disrupt hydrogen bonds. You could add acids, you can increase temperature, you can add a strong base, you can add salts. All of these things would interfere or an oxidizing agent, which would break up this. You can add chemicals or physical factors. You, you could actually just be mechanical and you can just like put force onto the molecule and, and, and beat the protein out of its shape. And so there's ways in which you could deform a protein shape. And then this is an example of what I was mentioning before about collagen, that it's a quaternary structure that, because it's made up of three polypeptide chains and then hemoglobin is four polypeptide chains. So whenever you have more than one polypeptide chain, it's considered to be the fourth level. And so when you put it all together, it's the primary structure forms these alpha helix and, and pleated sheets. And then three dimensionally, you have the tertiary structure. 
and then if there's more than one, it's quaternary structure. So proteins are sometimes more than one polypeptide, so it's not really accurate to say that polypeptides are proteins. Um, you could say that if there's more than one polypeptide chain. Now, I was mentioning before, if you wanted to break up the three-dimensional conformation, you could agitate it mechanically, you can disrupt it, or you could, again, alter it by changing the pH radically. If you, if you go alkaline or acid, that'll affect the, the R groups and therefore ultimately the shape. You can attack it through temperature. Temperature would also increase the kinetic energy of the protein and therefore disrupt the, the bonds that holds the structure together. If you've ever wondered why does temperature influence the shape of a protein, it's because you're agitating it to a point where you're breaking the R groups and so you lose the structure. It's called denaturing the protein. And again, if you added uh, something to break up the, site, the disulfide bridges, you would do that as well. If you break up a protein, it's probably probably not going to necessarily be able to go back to its normal shape. Maybe, maybe not. And so ultimately, um, these three-dimensional shapes are rather important. And so what we try to do is predict the shapes based on the amino acid sequence. And so there's powerful computers that try to determine the folding of these proteins because ultimately, it's sort of like designing a car to be more aerodynamic. If you can find the best folding shape uh, in the mature conformation, you might get a more efficient protein. You might think that all the proteins are as efficient as they can be, but apparently you can get better. And so what scientists are currently doing is that they use supercomputers to try to determine what the three-dimensional shapes of proteins are. And we also take x-rays of them, and using computers we can determine their structure. I won't get into the detail of this, but basically an x-ray is shot at the protein that's crystallized, and then the, it's diffracted, and then that's picked up on a, on a photo screen like this, and then ultimately the, through the density of the electrons that are bouncing off of it, you can come up, the computer can come up with a three-dimensional mo model of what uh, the protein would look like. And again, the different colors represent the different polypeptide chains, perhaps. So ultimately, what you're looking at is a, a, a three-dimensional structure like this. If you remember this somewhere in your past, proteins are are synthesized on ribosomes, and so that's where these amino acids are coming together. And so ultimately, if you if you look at the shape like this, three-dimensionally, perhaps these little pockets will provide uh, places where chemical reactions can take place, like for example, an enzyme. And then watch this. Even after this protein is produced, if you were to attach a phosphate onto it, that might alter the shape of it ever so slightly as well. And so there's post modification of proteins, which is rather significant. You can throw methyl groups on it like this, and that will affect it as well. And so it's rather, rather fascinating. So ultimately, proteins, polypeptide chains, and then three-dimensional conformations, rather important. So I hope you enjoyed this video on proteins. Thanks for watching.